Hello, embryology scientists. How are you today? I'm good, and this is the recording for lesson four that wraps up our embryology project. So hopefully you have all seen a chick from farm A hatch as well as a chick from farm B hatch inside the incubator. And as scientists, what did you observe in the incubators while they were hatching? Remember, scientists use their eyes, ears, sometimes their nose, their taste, but we're not tasting these chickens. And I know you can't probably use all your senses, but tell me what are some of the senses you were able to use as a scientist at home watching the videos. Okay, well, I bet there are some really great answers. So scientists, we have come a very long way since I first came into your classroom. You learned about the scientists who study embryos and you yourself became a scientist studying embryos called an embryologist. What we're going to do today is learn where the chickens go and we're also going to learn about self-responsibility and how to pick up and handle a chick and that the actions that you do will also reflect upon how the behavior of the chick is. So really quick, I'm going to share with you where the chicks go. Where do the chicks go? Where do you guys think the chicks go? To be used as showbirds at the county fair. The female chick is grown to full size, then used to lay eggs for us to eat. How many of you have had scrambled eggs for breakfast? Raise your hand. Awesome. To produce feathers for crafts and pillows after the chicken is harvested. To grow good strong muscles that we harvest so we have meat to eat to grow good, strong bodies, to grow meat for our pets to eat. To lay eggs to make new chicks. To scientists to do experiments on the meat, the eggs, and the feathers to help solve problems. Where would your chick go? So I want you all to think about that for a minute. If you were able to have adopted a chick, where would your chick go and what would your chick be used for? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about that and answer out loud. So I want you to know that all of the chicks that hatched have been adopted out to our Merritt County 4-H families and they are all doing well and safe. And I even kept 13 for myself to help replenish my flock of hens. So what we're going to do today is also crack open our two quitters here. And we're also going to chart the final chart to see how each classroom did. So if we do that really quick, I have Mrs. Telesis third grade class. So I want everyone to grab their scientist growth here chart, okay? So, Mrs. Telesis class had all winners. So your week four will look exactly like your week two, three, okay? So no more quitters. All eight Farm A were winners and all nine Farm B were winners. So after you have charted this, and you may have to hit pause so you can chart yours, then you can turn to your page, 4-H growth here, to see if your prediction that you wrote from day one matches the final conclusion. So in the final conclusion, I would want to write farm A had eight 
and farm B had nine. And just see if those compare, okay? Might be a little hard to see. All right, so then we have Mrs. McDiffitt's third grade class. And you guys are also lucky. Your week four looks exactly like your week three, which means all farm A eggs and all farm B eggs are winners. So again, you may need to pause. And after you filled out your chart, go to your 4-H growth here sheet. And we're going to write in farm A, that number was nine, and farm B was four. And see if your conclusion is the same. Your prediction and the conclusion match. All right. Now, Miss Jackson's third grade class. We happen to have had a quitter. So what I'll have you chart is your week four, you had 10 farm A eggs, but on week four, you had one farm B quitter and you had seven farm B winners. So be sure to fill in your farm A first, then come over here and fill out one farm B, then come up here and fill out seven farm B for a total of 17 winners. And then you can also go to your prediction and conclusion page. And what we're going to write is farm A had 10 winners and farm B had seven winners. All right. Hey, I was pretty close on that one. Okay, how are you? Were you close on that one? And our last one before we break open these quitters is Mrs. Thompson and Palmer. And as you can see, Mrs. Thompson's third grade class had nine Farm A winners, but they also had one Farm A quitter. So shade in nine Farm A winners, one Farm A quitter, and then over here, you'll shade 10 Farm B winners. And then again, you'll go to your prediction and conclusion page, and we're going to write nine Farm A winners and 10 Farm B winners. So it'll look something like that, okay? All right, scientists. So now what we're going to do is we're going to break open these two quitters to see about where they decided to quit. You'll see I have a towel here to be able to wipe my hands off. And when I picked up the farm B egg out of the incubator, it started already kind of cracking and breaking. And you can kind of see if I peel some of the shell off that that does anyone remember what that is that's just inside of the shell? It's the shell membrane. And so that shell membrane is keeping this little guy from oozing and gooing out. That's crazy. I'm just peeling the shell completely off. Okay, so now I have to bust through the shell membrane to see what what it looks like inside. All right. So I'm not smelling anything too horrible yet. But you'll notice he was almost fully developed. And then the yolk sac here started to go in to his abdominal cavity but it has kind of quit. I don't know why he quit. We'll never know why. All right, now here's a farm A. This one I'm gonna to have to crack a little bit. Oh, same thing's happening here. Oh, I did break the shell membrane though. All right. It 
again, as a scientist, I'm not observing anything too strong smelling yet. Now the eggs stopped hatching on the 26th. So if I left this in the incubator longer, I'm sure they would really start smelling more. Now this chick stopped or quit a little bit younger than the other one. It has a larger yolk sac, which has not actually started going into its abdominal cavity yet. So he probably quit maybe day 17. I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell. 17 or 18 maybe. And that was farm A. And farm B quit probably about day 19 or even 20. Not really sure what happened. So what we're gonna do quick here is <laughs> wipe our hands. I put some soap in my rag here. And scientists, I am so glad I got to spend all this time with you. I'll cover this in case it bothers you. It bothers some people and that's okay. I am so glad I got to spend this time with you studying how embryos grow and helping you become an embryology scientist yourself. I also thought it was great that we got to explore how engineers helped solve problems with the scientists by building them machines like incubators and turners and candlers. And if you have any questions, maybe you could get those to your teacher and your teacher could get those questions to me so I would be able to answer them. Again, all the chicks went to great homes. I'm gonna pause really quick and uh, get the last portion of our video with a live chick. Hi scientists, do you all see my guests beside me? So this is one of the farm bee chicks that hatched. And as scientists, again, we use our observations. So I'm going to be quiet for a little bit so that you can all observe what's happening. All right, so do you all hear the, ch the chick chirping or talking? What do you think that chick is saying? Maybe it's saying, I'm cold, put me back under the heat lamp. Maybe it's saying, hey, where's all my friends? Where are my, where are my buddies? Where's everyone at? I'm scared. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to help calm this chick down. I'll show you how to pick him up properly too. Okay, so you're going to use your hand like a little raincoat and a collar, okay? So you will put the chick's little neck in your collar, your hand goes over their wings like a raincoat, and then your other hand will be to set the chick on. And this way the chick feels safe and stable and secure. So again, I put my collar on my chick, my raincoat over the wings of the chick, I pick it up, and then I put its little feet on my hand so that it feels secure. So the chick is already a little bit calmer and um, I do feel his little legs kind of shaking a tiny, tiny bit. So now the goal though, that this chick is safe and secure in my hand is to try to put him to sleep. And this is by using what I call self-responsibility. And that's how you take care of yourself helps the attitude and behavior calm the chick down. And you'll see that I'm keeping my raincoat on the chick so he feels safe and secure. And here pretty quick, I'm going to be a little on the quieter side because if I was screaming and yelling, it might scare the chick even more. And what I wanna do is gently pet the chick and I'm gonna be quiet and see if I can get this chick to fall asleep.
Oh, I have another one, actually. I wanted to find one that was a little louder so that you all could hear one talk. Okay, so I'll put my raincoat on again and I'll gently pet its little head. So it's not working the best right now, um, but if this is something that you can try at home, if you have your own chicks at home, maybe you have a hamster or a guinea pig or a cat, and just sit there calmly and hold your animal calm and soft and pet it, and you'll start to notice that if your behavior is calm, the animal's behavior will also calm down too. And it's a great way to just spend time together with something. Okay, scientists, again, thank you so much for being awesome scientists these last four weeks during embryology. I hope to see you around and I would like to wish you all a happy and safe summer. See you all later.